Welcome to Module 10. This audio lecture will cover Chapters 33, 34, and we will finish with Chapter 32. The interpretations of caries, periodontal disease, and changes in dental restorations are a vital part of providing valued services to the dental practice. Many dentists rely heavily on a hygienist's ability to detect changes in the oral cavity from dental images. After you have finished viewing the audio lecture, proceed to completing the short extra credit assignment that will go towards your exam free grade. At the end of today's lab session, you should have turned in your professionalism and assignment grade sheets. Two radiographic assignments should have been completed by the end of today's session. The following audio lectures have been very successful in teaching interpretation. Much information is missed during class lectures, and audio lectures provide a great format for reviewing and working at your own pace. After each chapter lecture, the homework assignment will be presented. While watching the following lectures, please make note of any questions you may have by documenting the slide number and chapter. We will review all your questions in class prior to exam three. Chapter 33, Interpretation of Caries, is an interesting chapter and probably the most important one of your interpretation series. Dentists place a great deal of responsibility on dental hygienists to find and identify decay during, these, during their uh, recall appointments. Though we understand this is the dentist's responsibility more than ours, it still falls into our daily practice act that we must be proficient in identifying these lesions. And dentists have high expectations of your skills in detecting and identifying caries and to bring these caries to their attention. Perfecting this skill will not only bring a benefit to your patient, but will ensure your job security. Keep in mind as you train your eye to detect caries when radiographs are taken. For this lesson, in other course, for this lesson and other courses, you have already been instructed and uh, in how to detect or how to visually see decay and the microorganisms that cause its destruction. The demineralization of tooth matter can be seen in dental radiographs. However, destruction is not visible on onset. Identifying these lesions at their earliest point of visibility on radiographs is the main reason for periodic radiographic exams. Identifying dental decay requires both a clinical exam and radiographic exam. And due to the nature of a two-dimensional image, from a three-dimensional object, the oral exam can detect lesions not seen on radiographs. This holds true for radiographs identifying images not possibly seen visually. Interproximal decay may not be detected until 40 to 50 percent of the calcium and phosphorus is lost from the tooth surface. It is known that the severity of the de identified decay is always worse than radiographic appearances. This fact must be remembered when informing a patient of the condition of the need for restoration and care. The clinical exam requires the use of a mirror for light reflection, indirect vision, and retraction. This, these procedures were practiced in your instrumentation course early on. The explorer is used to identify pits, grooves, and fissures. You may have learned to use this instrument in detecting decay in these areas by adapting the light source that encourages a, a light force that encourages a stick. You may cause some difficulty, may have come across some difficulty in removing the instrument from the tooth surface if this pit had was quite deep. Be mindful of this procedure, not necessary to, to actually do this if visible decay is obvious. Placing an explorer into an open area of decay that is evident by sight may cause severe pain to your patient and further tooth damage. The identification of color change is another option in detecting oral decay. Though these changes do not always occur, and when they do are easily overlooked, it is important to know that they do exist and progress. Areas of white chalky matter in an internal Part of the enamel is evident of possible decay. These areas may, may or may not have black and darkened areas as these centers presented in the image above. Some may 
not be exposed in the oral cavity whatsoever and appear totally submerged between the two structures. They can be visible on occlusal and interproximal areas and sometimes more visible with direct light. These lesions may not appear in radiographs and the only early detection may be through a visual exam. Paying close attention to the color changes of the enamel when performing dental exams is only part of the decay, decay detection process that is accompanied by radiographs and complete in instrumentation. I've got my cursor laying over one of these areas and notice the change in the whiteness of this, this tooth that has got quite a bit of decay in it. Again, this arrow is also uh, illustrating this whitened area and then of course the darkening on the interproximal surface. As we move along, let's recap a few important issues. Though decay may exist, some teeth exhibit no visible signs of decay. Patients may state they do not feel any sensitivity and therefore may not accept your diagnosis. Education is your only tool. Interproximal decay caries are very difficult to detect to the, to the trained eye. It is necessary to find the lesion at onset. And even though a great amount of tooth destruction may have occurred prior to this identification, Bite wing radiographs are the most is the, are the best diagnostic tool for detect, detecting improximal decay, and becoming an expert at taking these radiographs is a must. Periapical radiographs, is done pro, if done properly, are also uh, excellent in, in, in determining interproximal visibility. But remember, the angulation of these radiographs does not affect the quality of the image, and therefore affect the interpretation value of the film. The angulation of bite wing radiographs has little to do with vertical angulation, which makes them the best image technique for decay detection. Higher KVP settings may uh, provide uh, an important role in creating a more diagnostic film in identifying decay. The decreased density that occurs from tooth destruction reduces the density of the tooth matter. Interproximal lesions then appear more vivid. Because of the penetrating strength of the x-ray beam passing through these areas of lesser tooth density. Density in this content refers to substance or thickness of matter. In other versions of density used in dental radiographs, we use the term to describe darkness. It is very important to grasp this concept and how it changes when referring to density of an object versus density of an image in a radiographic x-ray. So to recap this thought, density of an object will, will affect its appearance in an x-ray. If the object being radiographed is void of density, as in having less matter, it will appear darker on the radiograph. When describing the image on a radiograph, we use the same term lacking density and therefore has a darkened appearance. If this concept is difficult to understand, note that this is on slide six and I will review this in more detail when we are together in class. I always like showing this image to students. It provides a very good visual of the elusiveness of dental decay. The first three images all look innocent and free of decay. But when exposed by the diode dent laser, we are able to see that the teeth all have been affected by active decay. Take a moment, let's take a look at this slide and each one of the images and compare once the teeth have been drilled and the exposure of the decay visible. From the beginning of this course, you have been required to submit your radiographs and mounting for, for grading. This has been an exercise to prepare you for interpretation. Proper mounting makes for better interpretation. When the films are mounted for viewing, the distract, distraction of the surrounding light is eliminated, making the process easier. Using a magnifying glass is a common practice when working with film. Digital x-rays can be enlarged for better visibility. Two important techniques to remember is horizontal angulation and proper contrast and density. I realize these two concepts are always repeated and that may seem redundant at times, but they are truly what makes bite wing radiographs so useful. There are many types of caries. 
or should I say many areas for the occurrence of caries. We will cover these areas in detail. Radiographic classifications are determined by severity of lesions. Class 1, or also known as an incipient, this classification is defi defined by a lesion that has penetrated the enamel but is located only in one half of the distance from the enamel's edge to the midline of the enamel structure. Class 2, or moderate decay, progresses from the midline of the enamel to the dent enamel junction. It does not surpass the junction. Class 3, or advanced decay, moves beyond the dent holamin enamel junction into the dent, but does not evade beyond the midline of the dent towards the tooth pole. In our last classification, class three, class four is severe dental decay. This, class, this classification identifies the worst scenario as decay has moved beyond the midline of the dent towards the pulp and may have even invaded the pulp chamber. Black classification is determined by location. Some of these locations are not visible in radiographs, therefore they are not commonly used. Class 1 are pits and fissures, occlusal surfaces, buccal and lingual surfaces. Due to the two-dimensional image of a radiograph, these areas are not visible. Class 2 and 3 are interproximal decays that are defined by either their posterior or anterior location. Class 4 is the involvement of more than one surface, a lesion that has evaded, invaded the incisal edge and the interproximal surface of an anterior tooth may be class 5 by this classification. And class 5 is, reter, is, reser, is referred to as cervical areas of the teeth, and class 6 involves the coronal part of the teeth. These classifications are best used in dental charting, more so than radiographic interpretation. Going back to radiographic interpretation of decay and moving away from blacks, I will leave you with the re, to review this chart on your own. I was I created this to help you review the radiographic classifications and the possible areas that they may appear when exposed to, to uh, x-rays. The following slides will go into more detail. Interproximal decay is located on two adjacent teeth surfaces. If it is identified just below the contact point, the beginning of the lesion can take on a triangular shape as they then penetrate into the tooth structure, reaching the dent enamel junction. The degrees of progression range from one to four. Incipient and proximal decay extends less than one half through the enamel surface. Incipients, which means early lesions, these lesions are rarely seen on radiographs, and when they do appear, it may be due to the excellent technique and the visible trained eye to spot them. They also may be more advanced than visually, visually seen, as we have noted earlier in this presentation, that radiographic image of decay may appear much less involved than, true, than when the true uh, restoration is complete. Moderate interproximal decay extends more than one half through the enamel, but does not involve the dent enamel junction. These lesions are only seen in the enamel on radiographs. Typically, 40 to 50 percent of the tooth structure has been invaded before these lesions are detected on film, and when restored, may become class three. Advanced interproximal decay extends through the dent enamel junction, but not more than halfway towards the pulp. At this point, the dent and enamel are involved in tooth destruction. Severe interproximal decay instead extends past mid midline of the dent and towards the pulp and may have invaded the tooth pulp. This type of decay may lead to more aggressive dental restorations and fillings. The bite ring radiograph has several areas of decay. This image is of the maxillary left molar premolar area. Let's walk through an examination on this radiograph and identify the lesions. Starting with tooth number 12, I do not see any visible decay on this tooth. Tooth number 13 has a class 12 
I do not see any other visible decay. I'm identifying the lesion. Tooth number 13 has a class 2 on the distal. The lesion is more than one halfway through the enamel and maybe worse than a class 2 when restored. I do not see some penetration into the dentin of this tooth, but the defining enamel dentinal junction is still quite visible. When this area is restored, the decay may be much worse than visibly seen in the radiograph. Tooth number 14 has a class 3 on the mesial surface. The distal has an overlapping and therefore makes diagnostic interpretation impossible. Dropping down to tooth number 18, it does appear that an incipient decay may be developing on the mesial and the proximal surface, and the distal surface is void of decay. Dropping down to tooth number 19, it has a very large decay on the distal surface. Classification of this lesion would be a 3, possibly a 4. Only through restorative means will we truly know the diagnostic classification of this lesion. The decay could not be classified and uh, this decay could not be classified because it is reoccurring as it most likely started on the interproximal surface and not on the occlusal. The number of tooth number 20 has a lesion on the distal surface. This lesion has a perfect triangular shape typical of the mode of destruction and tooth decay. I would classify this lesion as a 2. It is more than halfway through the enamel, but not quite through the dentin enamel junction. I am not seeing any other decay on film. I'd like to go back and take a moment to look at uh, 19 again. Uh, what I was stating earlier is this decay may not be classified as reoccurring. I'd like to uh, reiterate that because it is starting in a new location on the tooth. If this decay was occurring on the occlusal surface, or underneath the existing filling, it could be classified as reoccurring. Take a moment to view this presentation. The radiographic image of a tooth is one of smooth, unbroken contour with uniform densities of enamel and dentin. Observe changes in contour and or density may indicate pathosis. In this bite wing radiograph, the density of an area of enamel on the distal of tooth number 30 has changed from radiopaque to radiolucent, indicating tooth structure has been lost. This is the picture of proximal dental caries beginning just apical to the contact point. On the mesial of tooth number 31, the density of both enamel and dentin has become more radiolucent. This is the picture of proximal dental caries spreading from enamel into dentin. I have placed several of these video clips um, in the uh, presentation, so hopefully they'll add a little bit more information as we progress through this uh, lesson. Occlusal decay is located at the center of the tooth on the chewing surfaces. Visual exams are used, are best uh, used to detecting the the decay as well as using explorers. Uh, this classification is not seen on radiographs. Moderate occlusal decay may be seen on radiographs, but it is easily overlooked. They appear as small oval darkened areas immediately below the occlusal enamel junction and dentin. Take a moment to study these images and train your eye to notice the small uh, lesions that are appearing. They uh, vary in size and is limited to one half the distance from the enamel dentinal junction to the midline of the dentin. Advanced occlusal decay will extend halfway into the dentin towards the pulp. The circle surrounding the lesion may um, be repositioned into, on this slide. Uh, it may be difficult for you to see, but uh, you may be able to see the haloing darken effect uh, within the circle. And take a moment uh, to make this change in your workbook so that way you can get a good image of this, of this um, area of decay. The darkened area is advanced occlusal decay followed by uh, enamel junction involvement and are much
much easier seeing as decay as it decay progresses. Severe occlusal decay is quite obvious. It has passed beyond one half of the distance towards the pulp. Now the radiolucency becomes large and dense and the area becomes similar to that of the pulp. Uh, this area that's circled in red, you can see that there is uh, still a little matter of two structures separating the amount of decay. However, this area may have penetrated somewhere in the tooth structure and the root and the uh, pulp of this tooth may have gotten involved. I think these images are realistic situations, provide uh, an excellent example. Excuse me, I had to uh, stop for a moment. Let's go back to this slide. I think these images are realistic situations. Uh, they provide a great example of how elusive dental decay can be. The radiographs provide the only means of detecting decay because these small, small occlusal pits did not give way of the severity of these lesions. Only through the radiographs did we note that a class 4 um, decay existed. So the closer we look at these images, we can begin to um, realize that the degree of um, destruction is real and that these visual uh, examinations, even though we can look at this image here, uh, doesn't actually reveal the severity of the situation. Note that this tooth had also had a sealant placed on it, and you may not know what a sealant is, but it's a protective coating that hygienists apply to the occlusal surfaces of teeth to prevent them from uh, getting decay. So with that said, uh, the application is only as good um, at preventing the disease as it is in uh, maintaining the, the uh, sealant surface. So let's move on. Uh, buccal and lingual caries are similar to occlusal caries when comparing location and appearance. They tend to have a more circular centered and circular appearance. Um, again, as with occlusal decay, they are difficult to detect and can only be done so with a very trained eye and uh, quite a bit of experience. Note that these little lesions may appear more rounded and um, and slightly below the occlusal surface, um, especially seen in this film, we know that it's not related to the existing filling because it's almost established itself with its own area. The mental and root surface decay is isolated to the dental surface of teeth. A recession may or may not be present in the occurrence of this decay. Recession is when the bone level has dropped and so has the tissue exposing a part of the tooth that would normally be covered with tissue and bone. This decay is notorious for appearing um, with the in invasion of third molar um, trying to erupt as, a, as shown in this image uh, in the upper left. Uh, the pressure of the distal of the second molars um, from the third molar movement creates this destruction of root surface. Um, uh, and it causes the decay to be more, uh, more of a mechanical force than a bacterial invasion. The mental decay can appear due to poor oral hygiene and commonly seen on the anteriors of teeth. Uh, we look closer at, um, at this in the areas of rampant decay in the upcoming slides. Recurrent and secondary decay appears around restorative um, material. This decay can be attributed to poor oral hygiene, diet, ill-fitting restorations, or restorations that were performed without complete decay removal. They are found around the margins of restorations and fillings. In the early stages, they are difficult to detect because of what we call the mock band effect that occurs between the metal restoration and the tooth structure. We will spend more time on this concept in upcoming slides. Rampant decay is advanced to severe decay affecting children with poor diet. Uh, with this, we see decay in patients taking uh, methamphetamines because of the lack of salivary flow that occurs from the use of the drug and the change in the pH of saliva. High sugar intake and medication can also bring about this situation. The elderly sometimes are, more, are faced with this condition due to recession and medications that affect the lack of salivary flow in 
decrease the um, air level of decay that I've seen in elderly patients. Notice I have added illicit drugs to this slide. It does not appear on your handout, but felt it necessary to include it. There are several conditions that resemble dental caries, and in reality, they may be false positives in interpretation. Cervical burnout and mock band effect are two of the most commonly seen uh, situations. Cervical burnout is created from areas of lesser density of tooth structure and located at the cervical areas where the enamel and cementum meet. Mock band is due to horizontal angulation creating an optical illusion of overlapping interproximal areas or around orthodontic or metal uh, appliances. This follow, the following slides ha have been uh, reorganized from the ones that you have in your workbook as I have added two, uh, two uh, better images to help you understand this concept and illustrate it. Uh, mock band is an interesting concept. It plays in the realm of optical illusions and radiographs. It is due to the horizontal angulation errors created in overlapping of images with the enamel and the metal of an orthodontic appliance uh, and, in, and in reaction to the natural teeth structure. The overlapping creates a false positive for decay, detection, and appears at the interproximal areas of teeth and at the presence where the orthodontic appliance intersects the enamel or coronal surface. The images clearly show the darkening around an arch wire and the illusion of decay. Your arrows are pointing to that to help you illustrate it. And note that the mock band effect on these interproximal areas almost give the illusion that these teeth have decayed. Let's take a closer look at the interproximal space and how overlapping creates this optical illusion. This slide is not in your workbook as I have added it for a better understanding of the concept. A small area on the radiograph has been enlarged to show the mock band effect created by this um, by horizontal angulation and the darkening that occurs from the overlapped interproximal space. The close-up of, of the image lets you see how difficult it is to diagnose decay and the importance of correct angulation, especially when exposing bite wing radiographs. You see the red arrow, how it's identifying the darkening area. Now we know that this area is not decay, but due to the fact that we have a, an overlapped horizontal angulation area, it definitely appears as such. Let's take a closer look at cervical burnout. Students always have difficulty with this condition and, what, and want to view this as rampant decay. The alveolar bone provides contrast to these areas and sometimes makes them appear worse than they really are. Uh, this is a situation where the tooth structure does not exist in the area, but that the density does vary. Um, excuse me, I want to repeat myself. The tooth structure does exist, but because the density of this area is weak, radiation flies through these areas, passing through, giving them an image of void of tooth structure, and it's strictly an optical illusion. There is no decay present, and the tooth is sound. The shape of the tooth's contour may play a role in this condition, and appears that it does not um, and, and as it does on radiograph image. So let's take a closer look. Look at these red arrows. They're identifying this air, these areas of cervical burnout. These are not areas of decay. Note how closely related they are to the uh, alveolar crest. That is an indication that they are not decay. They are covered with bone. Most likely this area is totally um, covered with interdental papilla, not visible from um, a visual exam. Um, and looking in this image, you almost see the ditching out of the teeth structure. Again, note the uh, location of the alveolar crest. Most likely, this is interdental papilla covering the space. And as we know, dental decay does not occur subgingively. It has to be in contact with, um, with air. This is not an anaerobic bacteria, but an aerobic bacteria. So that's how we understand where um, this these areas of cervical burnout are not associated with an interproximal decay or recurrent uh, root decay. Okay, let's take a look um, at the decay of, in cervical burnout. Um, 
and compare the two. Red areas are decayed, blue areas are cervical burnout. I kind of did a little coloring there for you. Not the best artist, but you can get an idea. And again, I've done this again. Now, we're taking a closer look because we do have uh, both rampant decay in this slide and cervical burnout. I have circled the areas in red that are decay and circled the areas in blue that are cervical burnout. There is obvious a great deal of decay and it's much harder to detect the cervical burnout in situations like this. Without a visual exam, of course, we cannot be totally certain that what I've outlined in blue is not maybe the beginning of some area of decay. I'm going to assume that it's not. In the cervical region of almost every tooth in this radiogram, there is a diffuse radiolucent area with an ill-defined border. This represents the image of cervical burnout, a normal finding. It does not represent the loss of tooth structure, but is caused by the normal morphology of teeth that allows for a greater quantity of x-rays to pass through the area. In addition, cervical burnout is perceived to be even more evident because of its proximity to the more radiopaque bone-covered root. Cervical burnout may have the appearance of a fan-shaped, diffuse, and ill-defined radiolucency associated with posterior teeth shown in the illustration to your left. Or it may take on the appearance of a diffuse and ill-defined banding in the cervical region of anterior teeth as shown in the illustration to your right. You should expect to see cervical burnout associated with the cervical region of almost all teeth that have a good level of bone support. It should not be confused with a proximal carious lesion that begins more to the occlusal or incisal, just apical to the contact point. Also, it should not be confused with root surface caries that appears cupped out, more darkly radiolucent, and usually requires bone loss prior to initiation. I hope this has helped you um, explain the, the two conditions a little bit better. When studying the radiographic image of teeth, I have another you to be aware of two artifacts of imaging. First, when the images of two very dense objects are superimposed, the image of one appears to be outlined with a radiolucent band. This radiolucency does not represent a loss of tooth structure, but instead is an optical illusion. Second, two objects physically in contact will appear to be separated by a radiolucency. This is referred to as peripheral burnout. This is evident because the narrow point of contact between the objects allows more x-rays to pass than the adjacent thicker regions of teeth. I think this, uh, this kind of helps you, these videos. They are very informative. Okay, we'll move into an area now of Carrie's interpretation and documentation. All visible decay must be documented in the patient's chart. Let's practice now how these lesions are drawn to accurately display their condition. Notice the outlined red on the distal edge of tooth number 19. And if this area had to be drawn in the patient's chart, it would be drawn in this manner. Again, here are a few other examples. Note I have an area of occlusal decay, two areas of interproximal decay on the lower, and one area of uh, decay on the maxilla. Are you seeing any other areas? I don't think I am. Okay. And a little stab at my computer drawing. And this is how you would document this in the patient's chart. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, mesial number 13, mesial 14, 
a kuzel of uh, 15, note that, directly under the uh, cusp. Um, they may be a few other areas, on, possibly on 19, but the image is not clear enough for us to document. And again, a visual image of how they would be presented in the patient's chart. Okay, we uh, have some uh, recurrent and new lesions here. Uh, number 12 has a recurrent lesion under the occlusal filling. Uh, and the mesial of, not, of 13 has a new lesion uh, uh, stated to the, uh, that I've outlined. There are also recurrent lesions on the occlusal of 30, possibly a lesion also developing on tooth number 20 and 21. And this would be a drawing with the best uh, use of PowerPoint tools. Okay, another example of recurrent decay on several teeth. These are all recurrent decay on the uh, occlusals, uh, on these occlusal fillings, except there is one new interproximal decay on the mesial of number four. And again, a drawing for you. All right. Follow the homework assignment instructions for illustrating the conditions found in this radiograph. All right, so we've finished our uh, interpretation of decay, and we're going to be moving into Chapter 34, which will be on the interpretation of periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is a disease that affects the gingiva and periodontal structures. This disease causes inflammation and bone loss. It is detectable on radiographs, but again, like dental caries, destruction must be advanced enough to detect in, detect in film. The alveolar crest is where you will find the initial sign that the disease is present. Sometimes visual exams may be misleading and the signs of swelling and redness are not obvious. Bleeding upon probing and soft tissue pocketing form, the depth of these pockets can be referenced to the appearance of them in film. The nature of a parallel technique provides an, ex an excellent visualization of the severity of periodontal disease. The lack of distortion found in this technique is why we recommend it so well. Uh, we will discuss this in more detail in the upcoming slide. During clinical examinations by dentists or hygienists, the evaluation of this soft tissue will provide signs of the disease. I see you have met lover boy. Yes, his mouth is quite overwhelming. Uh, and soft tissue can appear inflamed and red as previously mentioned with bleeding and swelling exudate present. The sulcus depth changes in re to reflect the severity of the disease and determines its classification. As with dental decay, severity determines classification. There are two types of classification, but we will only learn the American Dental Academy uh, of Periodontal Classification in this course. It's referenced to as the ADA. If in, in, in the Upcoming courses, you will learn more about the American Academy of Periodontal, Periodontology classification. As mentioned before, with dental decay, radiographs alone do not detect periodontal disease. Soft tissue must be visually examined for changes that will lead to early detection as soft tissue and early bone level changes. Uh, radiographs are two in 2D images in three-dimensional objects, so buccal and lingual surfaces are not well represented and difficult to evaluate. In areas of molar furcations, bone loss is most difficult to detect, and only through the use of a furcation probe can we truly be accurate in detecting that this defect has actually developed. You may not be aware of what a furcation is. Please note that this is slide number 50, and I will be happy to explain it if you're not aware of this periodontal um, deteriorate, area of deterioration. Using radiographs during an exam will provide the pattern for the, of disease, distribution of the disease, and severity. Note that in this first image, a probe has been inserted into the pocket. If the measurement seen on the radiograph will be within one millimeter of its actual exam, noting that the tissue has not, been, has not receded. As mentioned before, this is possible only through the paralleling technique and lack of distortion magnification. When doing periodontal charting, we must always have the radiographs with us. 
if by chance you do not probe a one millimeter increment around a tooth, you may have missed an area of vertical bone loss. Radiographs can help you in detecting these conditions subjunctively. Another important concept is when you take your probing measurements, you will have lingual and buccal readings that may differ. This is seen in this may be seen in radiographs. Take a note on the image one with the probe. You can faintly see a level of interproximal bone intersecting the probe. This is caused because the bone loss measuring is only on one side. We cannot determine from a radiograph which side bone loss exists, but we do know that the probing depths will identify this. It is either going to be a facial or lingual bone area of destruction. Again, I apologize for the interruption. Radiographs that are recommended for detecting periodontal disease are not the same as those for dental caries. Bite wing radiographs are not recommended, especially because of the horizontal placement of bite, um, placement, uh, bite wings, that is. Vertical placement of bite wing radiographs do deserve to, uh, are reserved to evaluate bone levels. However, horizontal placed receptors provide limited information on root areas and are not recommended. So, however, in the early stages of periodontal disease, they can provide information on changes in the alveolar crest. Periapical radiographs are recommended and provide the necessary information for diagnosing and monitoring periodontal disease. And again, paralleling technique is preferred over bisecting to reduce distortion. These films provide the earliest signs of the disease and its progression. Um, the least used radiograph uh, for periodontal um, detection is panoramic x-rays. Uh, they do show periodontal, periodontal disease, but not until the progression is quite advanced. Notable changes in the alveolar crest provide the first radiographic detection of periodontal disease. Typically, the alveolar crest is seen 2 millimeters apical to the cemental enamel junction. The loss of this ridge is seen as blunted. In the um, initial anterior region, the area of this ridge is slightly pointed and again loses and becomes very horizontal. In the posterior region, region a velar crest is not as pointed as an anterior, and the initial sign of bone loss is a loss of the cortical bone that creates the alveolar peak. Uh, taking a look at image one, oh, too many interruptions. Okay, let's take a look at image one. The green arrow is pointing to a nicely formed um, and disease free alveolar crest resting one millimeter below the CEJ. The yellow arrow starts to show a slight loss of the cortical plate. The loss of bone is very slight and may be easily missed if not looking carefully. Uh, this may not even register on your probes when you're doing your oral exams. The red arrow shows complete loss of the cortical bone and exposes the underlining and weak trabecular bone structure. They, the probing depths may or may not register a one millimeter change in depth as the tissue attachment in this region may not have changed to reflect the bone loss that is evident. An oral evaluation using your probe may not provide any evidence whatsoever that alveolar changes are occurring. However, the radiographic exam does provide a different picture. In image two, uh, we see advanced periodontal disease. The green line illustrates the original bone level and the red line outlines the current condition. Two-thirds of the supporting bone is gone and the prognosis for these teeth is very poor. Changes in the lamina dura and the periodontal ligament can only be seen with radiographs. Image one shows a healthy lamina dura and PDL. The distance between the cortical bone forming the lamina dura and the tooth surface is filled with the PID ligaments. The distance is normal and healthy. In image number two, you can see how the PDL is widened and widened closer to the area of the bone loss, the, but the narrowing uh, but narrows closer to the apex of the tooth. This widening corresponds to the disease that is present. So you can see how changes in the lamina dura and the PDL provide vivid indications of bone loss and current periodontal disease. 
Sometimes these conditions are evident in radiographs without any change in probing depth. These conditions are due to, for, to, uh, due to trauma or occlusal trauma. Uh, and uh, we will touch on this a little bit later when we discuss pathology in radiographs. Bone loss occurs in patterns. We have two identifications, horizontal and vertical. Horizontal bone loss occurs in, destruct, in destruction in a pattern that is parallel to the CEJ. Vertical bone loss is in oblique uh, orientation to somewhat per perpendicular to the CEJ. Let's take a moment to study these two images. Uh, there can be both horizontal and vertical bone loss in an interproximal area. We can discuss this in more detail in the upcoming slides. Note that I'm identifying the horizontal level where the bone and originally was, and then the peak to the vertical bone level. We have an image here that is actually showing some level of bone on one area. Again, this defect may only be present on either the facial or lingual aspect of a tooth, and probing depth will be needed to determine that. Periodontal disease is classified by distribution, uh, also uh, referred to as location. Areas that are located, isolated are referred to localization or localized areas of disease. These isolated areas, both horizontal and vertical, orientate, uh, originate. Original bone loss can occur in these areas. It doesn't actually, it, it's not actually determined by the type of bone loss, only that the location. Severity can vary as well as does their description. Whether it is a patterning or distribution will determine the severity. Image one identifies only one tooth having bone loss. Generalization occurs when the periodontal condition is evident throughout the arch or quadrant. If the condition is generalized throughout the entire mouth, the condition will have a presence of 30% or more across the dentition. Both horizontal and vertical bone loss can be present, and again, severity is not defined by location or distribution. Image 2 shows bone loss throughout the entire quadrant. We will begin defining severity. This is at the, the least of three classifications and the most important. We will use severity to determine the major classification of periodontal disease. Slight, which is shown in this image, is very, has very minimal bone loss changes. Only one to two millimeters of crustal bone change will occur as seen in this radiograph. This slight, the slight peaks over the alveolar crest have been lost uh, due to either bacterial infection or possibly occlusal trauma. Not all bone loss is disease related and, will, and we will learn this in our advanced, your advanced course. But uh, for our lesson and in the study of early periodontology, we will focus on bone loss as a disease. Uh, moderate bone loss occurs when 10 to 30 percent of the supporting bone has been destroyed. Note the changes between the green and red line. The red line indicates the migration of bone and the loss of support. Three to four millimeters of bone has been lost, and when probing depths reach areas of three to four millimeters, readings uh, determine this moderate bone level and are most common. Severe bone loss, also referred to as advanced, is, most, is the most threatening bone loss in tooth survival. This aggressive type of bone loss involves more than 33% of supporting bone. Probing measurements range in the 6 millimeter and higher. Prognosis of this situation is relatively poor. The American Dental Academy, referred to as the ADA, classifies periodontal disease by severity, location, and distribution. We will review the, each of these classifications as you will need to be responsible for knowing them and determining your patient's periodontal status in clinic. Take a moment to view this image. It is a very good example of the progression of periodontal disease from the early stages of periodontitis to the more advanced stages. Dentivitis does not appear in radiographs. It is an infection of the tissue and does not cause bone destruction. The ADA has labeled gingivitis as type 1. The alveolar bone in the interproximal areas have, has not been 
resorbed or affected. Uh, we use, uh, we can see the cortical plates fully formed, uh, leaving the alveolar crest in natural um, condition. Mild, or also referred to as slight periodontal disease, refers to the early stages. There are slight crestal bone changes that involve the first one to two millimeters of bone. When probing these areas, readings will be no greater than four millimeters, typically between the three and four millimeter range. You will notice that these that in these slides, uh, it seems to be slight re repetition. You are correct. The ADA classifies disease by severity, which we just reviewed in a few slides back. The following slide will be a repeat as well, but you will be able to place this classification into context on how to use it in diagnosis of periodontal disease. This image illustrates mild periodontal disease as referred to the ADA class type 2. Take a moment to study this, these changes. This slide demonstrates how we will chart periodontal bone loss in our clinical chart. Note that the identity that we have identified horizontal and vertical bone loss changes. Bone loss uh, is a must to be carefully documented for comparison between dental visits. When illustrated, it is easy to read. These drawings should coincide with the numerical probing depth that you chart. ADA class type 3, moderate periodontal disease, uses, uh, is used in our clinic and referred to as chronic. Uh, you may be exposed to this terminology as many dentists and hygienists were trained to refer to this stage as chronic and not um, uh, moderate. New uh, dentition uh, definitions and assessments have chosen to rename this stage as moderate. 10 to 30 percent of bone is lost at this stage and probing readings are in the 3 to 4 millimeter range. Both horizontal and vertical bone loss is evident. The condition can be localized or generalized. If the condition is generalized, then probing measurements will be in the 4 millimeter range throughout 30 percent of the dentition. You may not have seen exposure of frications in your periodontal course, but we will introduce the condition to you in radiology as it, as it is a definite sign of this classification when visible. Frications are areas on the tooth anatomy where a root begins, where the root begins and uh, the coronal part of the tooth uh, are associated. Bone levels recede. These areas are then exposed. Being they are located on the facial and lingual surfaces of mandibular molars, we can see that the change in bone level rather quickly. These areas may expose radiolucencies in radiograph, but may not show any clinical signs and, uh, when probed. I am placing my cursor on an area that is not very visible. This little black spot or darkened radiolucent area is a visible sign of a vocation. The bone level with the red line has dropped drastically enough to expose this area. You may be able to penetrate this area with a periodontal probe and find that the classification is possibly a 1. Uh, you will learn more about uh, probing for patients um, at the end of uh, instrumentation. This image is very good to identify a forcation. It has been circled in yellow. Bone has started to resorb in the area. However, the attached gingival fibers may still be intact and therefore there will be no probing depths or penetration into the forcation. Um, this is why radiographs are so important to detect these in the early stages. Not only does bacteria cause periodontal disease, but occlusal trauma may also have, uh, have um, aided in the loss of bone. Take a moment to study this slide. If you had to draw the previous image on your, on your patient's chart, this is what you would be seeing. Notice I have identified the bone loss and the forcation. There is also one more item I'd like to include, and that is calculus. We will review calculus formation and its appearance in the upcoming slides. I have not mentioned it earlier, but I am hopeful that you have caught the fact that this that bone loss um, that I've charted this uh, situation in green you will use a green pencil when drawing these lesions in your clinical chart and for assignment purposes in this course.
Uh, our last classification was advanced, and uh, which used to be called severe. Bone loss has increased over 30% in the stage. Probing depths are now reading five millimeters or more. Uh, for patient involvement is com commonly seen and obvious. Calculus may or may not be present. Let's take a moment to view this slide. Notice I have drawn the bone loss to include the apex of this tooth. I, I did so uh, so that way you would notice changes in the PDL that's involved. This tooth has little to no bone attachment on the distal root. I apologize, this is the mesial root. Uh, there exists both severe vertical and bone loss. Um, and calculus is present. The calculus may be um, not be visible to your eye, but with some training you will see it uh, fairly clearly. It is actually lining the, the edge of the um, mesial root on this um, tooth. Uh, okay, so here is a previous uh, radiograph with an illustration on the periodontal condition. Notice that I have identified the calculus in green bone loss, bone loss, and the drawing of the natural line of the bone. Per, uh, predisposing con uh, factors can encourage periodontal disease. We use radiographs to detect them when we cannot see them through visual exams. They are uh, removed by debridement, scaling and root planing, or through surgery. Move on. Uh, move on and take a closer look at the calculus and how it can be detected. Uh, how can how we can detect bone loss in the upcoming radiograph? Uh, I am sure you have been exposed to calculus at this point in time. It is a mineral deposit that appears whitish or yellowish in color when seen visibly. When seen on radiographs, it can appear as small nodules or smoothed over the tooth surface, giving it an, a, a, a sort of like a an impression of the anatomy that is not naturally there. We see their formation closer to the coronal areas of the teeth, and from uh, that point, uh, they migrate down the root of the tooth. The bone resorption is due to the toxins in the area and uh, the body's defense mechanism to the calculus. Uh, the, air, the yellow areas identifying the calculus formation. Let's take a moment to study these images. Time to review. Notice the green uh, dotted line was the original bone level prior to disease. Notice the solid green line. This is the current bone level. There is the beginning of a furcation in this image and it is uh, circled in green. Calculus is shown by the yellow arrow. Uh, also, I have noted that there is a possibility of decay. Now, what kind of classification um, do you find these carious lesions to be? If you guess stage 2 on the mesial of number 19, you are correct. Uh, the progression is only in the enamel and not more than halfway through. Uh, now on the distal of tooth number 20, I would say the classification is a 3. It is beyond the midline in the enamel and getting closer to the DEJ. What about the periodontal classification? If you have guessed stage 3, you are correct. I see a furcation that is beginning, so that tells me it is not stage 2. I see crustal bone changes that have actually eroded away the entire alveolar crest between 20 and 19 and between 19 and 18. That's right, you have gotten to learn your teeth numbers here. There is a small area of calculus. You may be asking, why are we not seeing calculus near the coronal areas? My guess is that this is residual calculus that has not been taken off in the previous cleaning. And the yellow area is identifying this little uh, area of, of calculus formation. This image has a lot of calculus and bone loss. We have not discussed calculus classifications and we don't usually perform calculus classifications through radiographs. Not that it's not possible, it's just not accurate. Bone level is drawn, and I would classify this patient as a class 3. I am not noting any carious lesions in this radiograph. 
but the calculus is extremely large and obvious. And the bone has receded away from the area of calculus, even though we are not noting calculus uh, beyond that point. Uh, most likely, this is still area of the calculus layering the size of the teeth. I repeat this slide so you can take a closer look at the calculus. It seems elusive, but it's there. Okay, this is how the last of our identification exercises for calculus decay and periodontal disease. We have decay on the distal of number 20. I would say this lesion is bordering a 4. It's definitely a 3 in classification, and the mesial of 19 is a class 2. Would you agree? Bone loss is uh, definitely a class 3, and you may, uh, and may be so severe uh, on the distal of 19 that it may be a class 4. We discuss severity and the percentage to make a general diagnosis, but when we do not have 30% or more of an affected area in the mouth, we can still identify an area as localized that is more involved. The frication is very obvious in this film, and the main concern for the condition may be uh, a classification of four. This would be a localized classification and not a generalized classification. This is somewhat confusing, but we will learn more about classifications in advanced clinical procedures. So if this was an isolated area in the mouth, it would be a three, possibly a four. We would need probing desk to confirm. The rest of the mouth may be 3 to 4 millimeter readings throughout in a generalized class 2. This is a bit confusing at first, but again, we will learn this later on in your education. As you can see, few areas of calculus on the distal of 19 and 20. Follow the homework assignment instructions for illustrating the conditions found in this radiograph. Our last topic on identification or restoration dental materials for an object seen in the radiograph. We will review the, all these, this entire list of restorations in the upcoming slides. This uh, radiograph is an image of several types of metallic restorations. They appear radiopaque because the radiation does not pass through the teeth and is trapped in the metal um, restoration. The areas of the film do not get exposed because the radiation does not pass through these um, metal restorations to actually expose the halide crystals on the film and therefore, when they get developed, they appear uh, radiopaque. Non-metallic restorations are quite different. The material is not as dense, so therefore, the, the x-rays do pass through, not quite as easily as they go through tissue, but they do go through, and there is some change in density that you can see. Uh, depending on the type of material, whether it's porcelain, composite, or acrylic, has something to do with the type of image you end up seeing or the type of um, dental material that is used in, in uh, the restoration. Porcelain is the most dense, and uh, it will actually have the least radiolucency, very noticeable in radiographs. Composites tend to vary in appearance, and the least dense are acrylics. These uh, types of non-metallic restorations are actually so lack of density that they have actually will appear as decay in film. I've got a few images coming up later on that I will illustrate this to you. Uh, amalgam restorations are metal restorations. Everybody's kind of familiar. They're also referred to as fillings. Are definitely very radiopaque. It's a metal or alloy. Um, they can be very distinct in their um, shape and depending on how the restoration needed to be placed. They are round, they can be small, they can be large, located on the buckle, the lingual, the occlusal, all areas of the teeth. Um, these images are showing two separate occlusal um, amalgam restorations. Um, this is a diagram of several 
as we see here in the radiograph. Restoration, restoration overhangs are an extension of amalgam or composite filling that actually goes beyond the natural coronal portion of the tooth. They typically fill up interproximal space and they require the, that in severe cases that the restoration needs to either be replaced. Sometimes hygienists can use their instrumentation and smooth off these um, overhang materials, but then they also may cause a dislodging of the whole entire film fill, uh, filling. So we need to be very careful in these situations. They have extremely uh, negative effects on the de on the oral cavity. They disrupt disrupt the natural cleaning of teeth, the natural contour of the teeth. They trap food and plaque. They contribute to bone loss and periodontal disease. Um, they also can cause amalgam tattooing. Typically, these uh, overhang restorations when they're deep into the tissue, the tissue will treat them as calculus and the body's natural defense will move into the area trying to remove or, or treat the, uh, the uh, foreign body and ends up causing bone loss because the tissue ends up re receding from the area of, of irritation. So restoration uh, overhangs are, are, are very, very bad and um, when we find them, if we cannot simply scale them or smooth them off, we refer them back to the dentist for removal. Foreign objects vary. Um, sometimes a patient may have had um, third molar extraction. These extractions, if in the case that the bone had to be uh, chiseled out or burred out, the burr may have broken and a fraction of that burr may be left into, in the uh, bone. Amalgam fragments are also uh, possible many times in restoration due to the fact that when a filling is being removed, uh, slight fragments enter into the tissue and are, are absorbed. Also, if a, uh, another area that is not, meant, is not illustrated is if a tooth gets extracted and the root canal, the residual of the root canal from the apex of the tooth is still visible or still left in the tooth, it will appear as radio opaque. This is an illustration of possibly um, amalgam fragments. And here is one for bone spur with a, a broken burr from a drill bit. Gold restorations come in two kinds. They are either foil restorations, little round radio opacities, typically on occlusal uh, um, or surfaces. This radio opaque image is very smooth and, very, and resembles uh, an amalgam. Crowns are also made of gold. They have a much different appearance than the crowns made of porcelain. They are, are large radiopaque restorations. They have very smooth contours. Uh, we can see that there is no residual type of material used around this bridge. And most likely this is an entirely gold crown uh, and gold bridge. This is an uh, entire uh, tooth is covered in uh, restorative material, and again, this is most likely a complete gold crown. Crowns and bridges also are identified by the uh, by each particular part that creates the bridge. Um, they replace missing teeth, and the abutments which support the crown and the ponic replaces the missing teeth. Sometimes there is a one tooth. Sometimes there is a two teeth um, replacement in this particular bridge, which we call this a four unit bridge, we have two pontics. We have two abutments and two pontics. Uh, note that there is another type of material creating the illusion of a, of a false tooth there. This is porcelain or some other type of acrylic. I'm not noting that there is another tooth here. It may be made out of different material and it's not radiographing at all. But these, uh, this whole bridge work looks like a bridge that is made out of gold, in my opinion. We will know that if we get a visual exam to confirm. Uh, stainless steel crowns are temporary. They are fabricated in the office. They are ill-fitting to the natural tooth. They are meant to be placed on the tooth and only there for a very short period of time. 
due to the fact that they do not fit the coronal portion of the tube, create some very bad situations for the gingival structure and the supporting bone. As we spoke of oral uh, overhang fillings, these stainless steel crowns left indefinitely in the mouth create the same problem. So in the instance of having to use this crown, it may have been that there was an emergency procedure. The dentist did a, uh, did a uh, remove the, uh, whatever was causing the infection or the decay, placed a temporary crown and possibly filled this temporary crown with a um, medicament of, of some kind to make the, the, uh, the pulp relax that may have been affected by this area of decay or trauma, however. Uh, happened. Uh, so they are ill-fitting Ill, Ill fitting, and they do not uh, have a very long life in the mouth. Post and core restorations are used when endodontically treated teeth require treatment. The nerve of the tooth is dyed and endodontically the nerve is removed and filled with a clay type of restoration. Uh, you will note in these films that I have given um, attention to these long extensions coming from the filling. These are called metal posts. They give support to a tooth that has lost a lot of its coronal uh, uh, structure. Filling the, the root nerve, the pulp chamber, is, a, is a, what we call the gutta percha. Again, this is a a fill material that is laced with a clay-like material and it slid down into the opening of these canals from the crown of the tooth and it gives stability to the root of the tooth. Uh, in this slide I am noting the coronal part of the tooth, the uh, metal supporting post, and the root canal fill with gutta percha. Surgical root canals are typically done when there is no other better way to treat an abscess. For some reason, maybe a, sur a surgical root canal going through the coronal part of the tooth, placing uh, the gutta percha, is not the best choice. So the, peri so the uh, endodontist typically burrows a hole through the cortical plate on the bone and ends up placing a filling material of either a composite or amalgam at the base or apex of the tooth to seal it from the, the communication with the bone. The, the nerve of the tooth may or may not be removed at this time, but the communication and the flow of blood supply and nerve supply between the tooth and the um, trabecular bone does not exist anymore when a surgical or uh, apicoectomy has been performed. Porcelain restorations um, are come in different images. Um, there is two that resemble um, a radio opacity, but it's not complete. The first image is outlined, and this is a this is a liner or cement that they use to secure the coronal porcelain restoration to the tooth. This is a completely fabricated uh, porcelain crown. This is also a fabricated porcelain crown but has one other piece of material. It has a metal core. The metal is actually glued to the natural tooth structure and the outer edge of it is porcelain fused to metal. So when you see the appearance of this tooth and the appearance of this tooth, they have the same similar appearance, but the metal structure inside the force infused to metal will appear very different in radiograph. Again, it's metal. There's no transparency with the x-ray passing through the tooth. Therefore, it's going to appear radio opaque. Composite restorations, as mentioned earlier, come in different classifications or densities. We have glass ionomers, we have acrylic, and we have those also made of porcelain. Uh, this is an image of the change in density and how they do appear a little bit more radio opaque, but not completely. They're kind of like a mixed radiolucent material as opposed to either uh, natural metal uh, restoration or the natural tooth structure. Okay, there are acrylic 
resin restorations that I mentioned earlier that when they are actually used to restore the tooth structure, the density of the material is so that they actually appear as filling, I mean as, as decay. But we know they're not because of the outline of the natural uh, prep that is done when this, when this um, re uh, restorative material is placed. There are several uh, restorative materials used in this. Uh, x-ray. We've got some filling material here and here around the cervical area of these anterior teeth. Also here, this may even be some recurrent decay, but you can see the change in the density and the mixed radiolucency of this uh, restorative material. And this is totally void, even though we do know there is acrylic material in this area. Here we have possibly a porcelain crown, but all I am seeing is the base material used to seal or uh, be the adhesive for the, between the tooth and the crown. We have a post on this area and we actually have a porcelain fused to metal. I'm looking at the metal base and here is the porcelain outlay. So there's a lot going on in this image as far as restoration. Restorative dentistry also uses what we call cavity liners or base liners. These liners are placed prior to the addition of amalgam or crown. What happens is these teeth get so, when, when the teeth are under restoration or under repair, the, um, the, the prep gets so close to the, the edge of the pulpal chamber that they need to put a base liner to protect this pulpal chainer from any um, conductivity of electricity or change in temperature in the tooth. Uh, so this liner is placed prior to the packing of uh, dental uh, amalgam. We also use uh, retention pins. Sometimes the restorations are so large that these small little retention pins are drilled into the natural tooth structure and be become like pillars and they, sh they, they act as extensions so that way when they build up these amalgams or these composite fillings, they actually provide more structure for these fillings. Without these pins, these filling material, the filling material may easily fall and break through the tooth. So you can see these little retention pins in this image. Here's one here. And here is a cavity liner. And it's directly underneath the amalgam restoration. Gutta percha I mentioned earlier is a clay-like material that fills the pulpal chamber for root canal. Very uh, low density, so you can see it, it, it's radiolucent, but not uh, as involved as a filling material or metal. Silver points is an old-time metallic material. It's a uh, like a, a file that we use, and it was used to uh, fill these chambers uh, when root canals were done many, many years ago. They are not as popular as, as they used to be. The gutta percha is more common right now to fill these chambers, but if you were to see a, a root canal that had very vivid radio opaque uh, structures in the canal, that would be a silver point as opposed to a gutta percha fill. Okay, prosthodontics. Prosthodontics is an area of restorations that deals with the replacement of natural teeth through partials or dentures. Um, when you take an x-ray and someone is wearing a full upper denture, which was a situation here, the teeth look like they're floating. There's no root. And you can even see the little uh, gouged out area that is used to actually uh, glue these teeth into the uh, partial or into the denture. A removable partial does have a metal base and it saddles across the uh, frugal surface. You can see the bars and arms of this uh, removable partial in this radiograph. Orthodontics, brackets, and wires. A uh, lot of going on with metal when we deal with orthodontics and uh, taking radiographs. This is a beautiful panorex, and it's, uh, I've identified the arch wire, the bracket, and the bands. Dental implants. Sometimes dental implants will 
will appear in a bridge. Sometimes they will appear as a single unit. I have two images here, both of which have very different types of implant posts. They have so many uh, types and they all vary in their structure. Um, so, but the point I'm trying to make is that these are metallic um, restorations that are actually screwed into the bone structure and the bone actually integrates with this metal, this is like titanium, and they actually create a bond. Notice in film number one, or where I have the bridge, can you see carefully that the small little brass lines that are used in this radiograph? They do so because the placement of implants is so precise and detailed that being one millimeter off point can absolutely cause the implant to fail. So this is a technique that's used by many doctors to see to it that they have placed the implant properly in the area and uh, they have measured correctly. The arterials of, or of oral surgery, uh, and here I've got a lot going on. I've actually got orthodontics because this patient's jaw actually was, um, I, I believe, fused together through orthodontia. Um, you can see that there is a bracket down lower along the border of the ramus where there was a break in uh, this patient. They've had some type of uh, trauma, and the bracket was used with screws to uh, secure the um, the mandible. Uh, and then again, here are areas of uh, arch wires and bands used for orthodontia. Uh, defective restorations I mentioned earlier, and we discussed uh, the overlapping and the overhang, uh, how these are uh, very, very bad for the health of the dentition. They uh, will hold food debris, bacteria, bring on gum disease. Um, they can be detected both clinically and radiographically. You can explore and feel that they are exposed beyond the natural uh, dentition or the natural anatomy of the tooth. They have uneven ridges and um, sometimes the margins are just in, in, um, are inadequate with poor contour. This is a lot going on. Uh, and here, and none of it is really very good. Um, so let's go through all the different images. I'm looking at uh, tooth number three. I have a very strange looking gutta percha root canal. It doesn't go all the way to the apex of the tooth. So I'm figuring that this is very poorly done. There is a post and uh, an amalgam filling. Uh, let's move down and take a look at the core buildup. And I believe there is a base that was used in this area. This is, again, another large filling with a severe overhang and some, some decay occurring. Again, in this image, on this is, must be tooth number 31, I have a large overhang filling. There is some calculus subgingival to that. And again, there looks like there is another core buildup in base. Okay, this is a, a little slide. Let's look at uh, the different images here. Um, I would say that one is a buildup and part of this restoration. It's kind of hard to see. Here we, again we have buildup. One is a buildup. One is a buildup. Here is one. Two is all our porcelain fused to metal crowns. Three are implant structures. Can you see the posts all the way across? Uh, four appears to be a crown made out of composite. This whole area, definitely not any porcelain going on, even though there is a base. Five is a full coverage crown. And these are all porcelain fused to metal, as mentioned earlier. So let's take a moment. You may want to study this slide later on, come back to it. There's a lot of uh, dental restoration uh, in, in this slide. Okay. Follow the homework assignment instructions for illustrating the conditions found in this radiograph. Next week, we will meet in class to cover the last two chapters in the course and review the material presented in the series of audio lectures. All homework will be collected at this time.